Hey friends, welcome to the Sample Ox Mystery Sample Challenge, where we will unravel a mystery product using our senses. Here's how it works. We have two guests on the program, a challenger and a category expert. Our challenger is tasked with tasting and eventually guessing the mystery product from three different possible descriptions. They'll be joined by our expert guest who chose the product and is quite knowledgeable about it. Our expert will guide us through the tasting and give out clues along the way. Today, we're going to be tasting a mystery cocktail with our expert guest, Donnie Clutterbuck. Donnie is the BOD director of the United States Bartenders Guild and primary bartender at Cure in Rochester, New York. He has a ton of experience working in all types of different bars with a whole bunch of different ingredients. He's best known for his work with citrus, which we will be asking him about in a moment. Uh, he's a real problem solver, solutions oriented thinker, creative guy. We just adore him. We're excited to have him. Thank you for being here, Donnie. You got it. How's it going today? Um, so the United States Bartenders Guild. I love that this exists, first of all, and I have to know more. So what does the U.S. Bartenders Guild focus their efforts towards? Bringing people together, mostly. It's it, People think that it is supposed to be so like a union or, or, or something that is to provide benefits and, and such, but that's like, that's a labor union. So I think a, a common misconception is the U.S. Bartenders Guild is like some sort of a, I don't know, a, a labor conjunction of forces in order to fight for equal wages and stuff. And we do like the ideas of those things, but we really just focus on keeping people together and providing a forum that everyone who has a common goal or a common, I don't know, an thought process, a common set of values in the same room together so they can share ideas, get better at um, their own jobs by sharing their jobs with other people. Great. Sounds like the ideal functioning of a guild. Um, so those of us who are regular bar patrons kind of have an idea of what it must be like to be a bartender, but we're probably wrong. So what's one thing about your uh, kind of daily operations that might surprise those of us on the other side of the bar? You know, I've been thinking about this. That when it, Someone once told me that if you walk into a bar and it looks like it's always been there and no one had to try to set it up at all, the bartenders or bar is doing a really good job. Um, the thing that most people don't realize is that it's not just fun for the three hours that they see it once a month or once a week or three times a week or however often they go in. There is a ton of prep, at least in a bar like Cure. I have to show up two to three hours early every day to make sure that the place looks like it has always been open and ready for you to come in. It shouldn't look laborious. No one should be able to see the behind the scenes details. And if they can, you've done a bad job. So I think that if you go to your favorite bar and it looks like it never was anything else and then everything has always been exactly where it is right now, um, that fluidity is the secret or the thing that no one gets to see unless they work in the industry for quite some time. Yeah, I love it. I love that it takes a substantial amount of effort to make that kind of tattered pre-worn feel. Um, well, Donnie, thank you so much for, for being here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, now I would like to introduce today's challenger. He is our friend, Chris Shields. Chris is the Director of Education at Rheingeist Brewery in Cincinnati, Ohio. He has a ton of technical brewing experience. He's a professional beer judge. He's one of only, only few advanced Cicerones in Ohio. Um, Chris's beer knowledge goes deep, and I'm really thrilled to have him here today. Thanks for being here, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to, uh, to, to try this out. Absolutely. So how are you feeling about the cocktail challenge? Are you feeling ready for the tasting? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, doing this makes you ready to drink a cocktail. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to, to jump in. I want to get it correct. So uh, I want to uh, make sure I, 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 I really dive in and uh, I'm, I'm like already hunting for clues in my, uh, <laughs> my, my very, uh, very uh, nondescript uh, cocktail here. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, so you are the director of education at Rheingeist. Uh, what exactly does this entail for you? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a, um, an odd title perhaps for a brewery, but uh, Rheingeist over, we're almost eight years old. And over that time, we've gone through a huge amount of growth. So as we grew, we realized that not only for our staff, our team, but everyone we partner with and work with, whether it's wholesalers, retailers, um, even just educating the public, we 
we've really decided and, and dedicated ourselves to the idea that people make better choices when they know what they're choosing. And, and mm -hmm. what started as staff education has just over the years that I've been doing this kind of spread into all the other asset uh, avenues of, of the business. And so a lot of what I do is, you know, just talking to people about beer and, and doing training, whether that's, with new hires or with our bar staff or um, the general public for special events or tastings, you know, those are, those are always really fun. That's when you get to interact with, with people and, and have that, that connection. And then the other thing that I do, which is um, where the benefit of my production background comes in is I act as a kind of a liaison between the production side and the sales and marketing side. And that can be really um, you know, these are, two groups of people that care very much about what we're doing, but don't always use the same words. You know, you and I have talked a lot about yeah. vocabulary and lexicon and, and translating between those groups uh, can be, if, if not challenging, I think it, it adds value to both. Yep. Yeah. So you're really bridging that gap. It's an important job. Um, I happen to know that you have a background in marine biology. Um, and so back in your marine biologist days, you were able to spend some time in Antarctica, which is incredible. Um, what were you doing in Antarctica and how did you kind of keep yourself entertained, uh, on that big block of ice? Yeah, that was a really amazing opportunity. Um, shout out to my, uh, master's advisor, Dr. Amy Moran. Uh, she, uh, her research focuses a lot on energy and energetics. And we studied marine invertebrates. So sea slugs, uh, sea spiders, sea urchins, things like that. And the idea is there's a, a big time relationship between your metabolism and temperature and oxygen. And that's really what we were studying because down in Antarctica in the ocean, it is quite cold. Uh, the water is about 28 Fahrenheit. And uh, because it's so salty, it doesn't freeze uh, at 32. And then, uh, but there's a lot of oxygen because there aren't very many plants in the, the water down there. Um, there's about 1200 people when I was there. So it's not as tiny and isolated as it seems. So it's very, it's more small town feel than like uh, isolated cabin in the woods feel. But yeah. they do a good job down there. There's a recreation department. They do activities. There's like a 5K. There's uh, three bars. There's a coffee shop. So, yep, just small town vibes. Um, love it. Well, thank you for being here, Chris. Um, so to kind of get us all warmed up, I want to bring Donnie and Chris back, and we are going to play a little game. <laughs> um, this is a game that we just kind of conjured up. Um, we're going to call it the Dive Bar Family Dispute. And as the name suggests, it's very similar to Family Feud, uh, where we surveyed the Draft Lab team to come up with the top eight answers to our question. You'll each have four opportunities to guess what's most commonly mentioned in our survey. <laughs> Are you guys ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Um, so the question is, what are the key characteristics you'd find in a good dive bar, specifically a good dive bar? And uh, Donnie, because you're so ready, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. What's something <laughs> uh, common across all dive bars? Focus on social interaction, not product. Uh, I'm looking at the board and... You know, I'm going to give it to you. The it, it was, you know, that that good one of it is like the memorable bartender experience. And so we're going to give that one to you, the memorable bartender experience. All right. Uh now Chris, what is the the next what's one of the the main things that you would see in a good dive bar? Uh I've had a few things uh, bounce around in the head since I had had some time to think about it. I'm I'm going to go with though um wood paneling. Wood paneling. <laughs> very, very good guess. Very good guess. Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> One of the things was the um, just kind of wood furniture, just like that kind of dive bar furniture. But I don't really know that it, it includes wood paneling. So, all right, Donnie, what is next? What's another one? Late or long hours. 
of being late or long hours. Mm -hmm. I love that you're taking the very hardcore bartender perspective of this. (laughs) And unfortunately, because we were polling draft lab people, we did not (laughs) come up with late hours. Unfortunately, um, I'm not going to give that one to you either. Um, So you guys are close now. Uh, Chris, what is next? All right, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with jukebox. Jukebox, you nailed one! Ding, ding, ding! <laughs> you got the jukebox. That was one of the things that pretty much every single draft lab person said. Uh, jukebox came up as one of our top. So you guys are neck and neck, one on one. Donnie, what's your next guess? Graffiti in the bathroom. I'm gonna give that one to you. It yeah. is <laughs> it is a dirty, messy, weird bathroom. Everybody yes. has a weird bathroom. My favorite dive bar, you can barely fit in there. I'm like five <laughs> two and I can barely fit. Um, all right, so you've got two points, Donnie. Chris, what's your next guess? Uh I'm gonna say uh shots. I think I'm gonna give Deeper. it to you. <laughs> you know, it's kind of with it. <laughs> Cheap beer was something that came up with all of us. Um, but you know what? Shots, I'm just going to go ahead and give that to you because I love a good dive bar with a good shots. Um, all right, Donnie, what's next? Okay, cool. One more. Ooh, You've got one yeah, more. One. This is this is for it, all of it. Carpeting where there shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. There probably shouldn't you know be what, any Donnie, in the bar. No. <laughs> there should be no carpeting. There always is. Donnie, I'm going to give it to you. Um, one of the <laughs> one of the things that consistently came up with the draft lab people was that smell. Yeah, and it's like I think that smell <laughs> is coming from the carpeting where it shouldn't be. So we're going to extrapolate out. You've got three points, Chris. What's your last one? <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm just gonna go with uh, neon lights. Neon lights was actually one of the top ones. Oh, it's ooh. exactly right. Neon lights. <laughs> Everybody's a little washed out. So congratulations, you guys tied. You're both winners in my book. Uh, Thank you for playing. All right, that was fun. So now we can go ahead and get started with our evaluation, what we're all here to do. So Chris, go ahead and open up your cocktail, pour it out, take a look at it, get started on visual. And while you do that, at the end of your full evaluation, you're going to be tasked with um, guessing what our mystery cocktail is from three different descriptions. So all of these descriptions feature Donnie's signature clarified lime cordial. So that's gonna be consistent through all of them. So it'll make it a little harder. And we're gonna discuss his lime cordial a little bit later. Um, So as you're tasting, consider which of the following best describes the cocktail that you're evaluating. Is it the tequila sour? Uh, Strong lime and floral aromas make up the tequila sour with a sweet kind of coating start, heavy body and moderately acidic finish. It features a uh, Reposado tequila. Or is it the tequila Sprewell? And this uh, tastes like kind of cooked of agave, lime, and apple aromas with a medium body and light acidic finish. And it features two different types of Blanco tequila. Or is it the Añejo Margarita? Uh, This kind of tastes like caramelized stone fruit, lime, and burnt orange with a medium body, tingling hot mouthfeel, and moderately acidic finish. This one features a blend of Blanco and Añejo tequilas. All right, so Chris, now that you've been able to take a look, let's go ahead and uh, hear what you you saw with the, the cocktail. What did you notice about the appearance? Uh, it's 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 clear. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean it's it, it's really uh, it, it's a fun activity. I mean, I, I feel like even my wall here is not being accurate to. There's just the the slightest amount of not even haze, but just cloudiness. It looks almost like chill haze um, in beer, I, which it may be. Um, I mean, it really. This is something that if uh, you set it by your bedside table when you went to sleep and you didn't finish it and you woke up in the middle of the night looking for a drink of water, you could you could run into some trouble here. Um, <laughs> just beautifully, I mean, it just, it's beautifully clear. Um, I'm like trying to decide in my basement command center if there's any hint of color and I don't think there is. So you really have no clues so far. Um, and we love that. Uh, Donnie, uh, so all of these descriptions feature some kind of tequila. So can you give us a tequila primer in two minutes or less? Totally. <laughs> tequila is made from agave, specifically Weber blue agave. Uh, tequila is a specific kind of mezcal. This is mezcal, anything distilled from agave. Tequila is a very small subsection, subsection of that that is a very specific kind of agave. 
Um, the agave has to grow from six to eight years before it's harvested. It's not very renewable. It's like you have to really pay attention. and It's, it's a long process to make it. Um, silver tequila is rested in a barrel or not at all for under two months. So it's basically like it can touch a barrel, but it really can't be aged. It can be rested. Uh, Reposado tequila, two months to a year, gets a little bit more time in American or European oak, one of the two 600 uh, liter barrels or smaller, which is the same rules as like bourbon or rye. So most of the time it's leftover barrels from cognac or bourbon production or something like that because they need to cycle them through because they want characteristics from the barrels. Uh, Añejo is one to three years and extra Añejo is post three years at all. And usually if there's a Reposado or above, there's some color to it, some caramel color, not necessarily added, but it looks like that. You're not allowed to add color to tequila. Great. So that should give you a few clues, Chris. So before we get started <laughs> with the tasting portion, Chris, some people love tequila. Some people really hate it. It's a really polarizing uh, spirit. Um, are you a lover? Are you a hater? And is there an equivalent in like the beer world? Is there something in the beer world that is equally polarizing? Yeah, I, I think the entire beer world to some extent is maybe as, as polarizing. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm in a funny spot where I, I like tequila. I'm not like a, a huge um, drinker of tequila, but I, I really do fall in that middle ground that, but I think you're right that most people are one side or the other. I mean, I'm on the, on the production side of me is I just want to say things like hazy IPA are polarizing uh, because I, I personally fought against them it, for a long time until I just stopped thinking of them, of them as IPA and started thinking about them as something that's just different. Yep. You know, when, when you, when you learn brewing, you learn how to make things clear and that things that are hazy aren't good. So that was a right. tough, uh, tough sort of challenge to to get past. You know, people either love IPAs or bitterness, I should say, probably, or they hate it. But yep. then other people are like, hate dark beer, which is wrong because dark is not a flavor. <laughs> okay, so before we go down that rabbit hole, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, hopefully today uh, you are going to be pushed into a lover of tequila instead of kind of being in the neutral area. So um, go ahead and Chris, get started tasting and doing the overall aroma and flavor um, of of the cocktail. And while we do that, while you do that, uh, Donnie, um, you started to work on this clarified lime project that we've mentioned a few times to solve kind of the citrus shelf life problem that is common in bars. Uh, so what is the process that you came up with to kind of solve that problem? So those are actually two separate concepts. The clarification solves a different problem. And there is a separate shelf life uh, stabilization that we use that, I mean, both of them are incorporated here. But the clarification is more for feel and structure. Mm -hmm. Because if you take, so, you know, when you drink orange juice or grapefruit juice, there is a texture. You can't see through it. It's opaque. So there's like a graininess to it. When you take a sip of that, your body, now knowing that it's grapefruit or orange juice, Braces for acid. So the acid is not as felt typically. So if we clarify anything, and this is just to go with the same example, grapefruit juice, there's no longer that citrus juice texture. It has the texture of like oily water sort of. So when you drink it, your body doesn't brace for acid. So the acid is way brighter. You perceive it as brighter. It's not that there's more. So with this, we can make something that feels like a martini, but tastes like a daiquiri. And we can under modify it, highlighting the spirit a little bit more. So if there's, if it's a tequila drink, which I don't know if I can say if it is or not, I'm not going to release this data. It's a tequila drink. Um, <laughs> when, when we make a tequila drink, we want it to be softened. A cocktail is meant to like turn down the edges of a spirit, but highlight its intricacies. So we don't want to have to beat it up with lime juice and sugar to the point where like, I don't know, our bodies need to know that they're there. We can use less of them if we don't alert your mouth that the acid is on its way. We don't have to put as much acid. And if we don't have as much acid, we don't need as much sugar. I started doing yeah. research on lemon and lime juice because uh, many of the big names in the cocktail industry wrote books that published data that said, it wasn't really data, it was more like people like lemon and lime juice at six hours. So there's like six hours old, you juice the fruit, six hours later you have what is ideally or archetypally lemon or lime in our heads. So most bars, most cocktail bars juice once a day. They juice at four or something like that. And then by 10, the juice is perfect. Up until then, it's astringent. And after that, it might be airing on the side of like milky or funky or something like that. So I was thinking, if you are doing the best thing and you're juicing every day, you're still, your juice is different. 
all day long, and it's not the best until 10 p.m. So you're gonna serve all your drinks at 10 p.m. How are you gonna like mitigate this problem? So I began vacuum sealing with a vacuum in wine pump, something you'd use to stabilize wine for the you know consumption the next day or after. So I did an experiment where I juiced every day for seven days, and I juiced every hour or every three hours on the final day. So at the end of it, I had you know fresh zero, three, six, nine hour juices, and then vacuum sealed one through seven day juices, and I compared. Um, what those fresh juices tasted like next to the vacuum sealed juices to see if maybe three day old vacuum sealed juice would taste like six hour old uh, fresh lime juice. And I came to the conclusion that it drastically changed the shelf life. You got 72 hours out of it now instead of 24 before it became milky, but it wasn't quite enough for me. So uh, we started pasteurizing. So if you bring it up to a simmer, let it roll back down and vacuum seal it, you have like 10 days where the juice is all the same juice and it doesn't really develop any of those volatile like again, milky, funky, moldy flavors and aromas that it gets. If you pasteurize, vacuum seal, and freeze it, I just opened a bottle from two months ago and it tastes like I just used it yesterday. So it's just a bazillion ways of stabilizing something to the point where we got it room temp stable, shippable. Yeah, love it. Um, so yeah, you've put a lot of effort into into the world of citrus and it's it's a good thing to do. Um, so yes, let's bring Chris back and let's hear what you had to uh, taste. So tell me a little bit about what you experienced. Did you get that kind of clarified lime flavor? Um, did you did you see what Donnie was talking about with like the brightness of the citrus? What did you get? Yeah, for sure. I think there's, um, I mean, one of the, the interesting and, and fun things with this cocktail is that it it is playing with your, your head a little bit. Um, I, you know, the, uh, as you were, as you were talking and I was drinking and thinking, I, I, I wrote down a tequila gimlet, which is like a weird, um, th but that's like kind of where I'm going. Like it just, it makes the, the cocktail seem just very simple and elegant. It's not, um, you know, there's like the aromas on this are, are lime and, um, you know, and, and tequila, like to me, like tequila, you know, there's an aroma associated with tequila that I can only describe as tequila. Um, there's, um, I think there's a, a cidery character to this um, a little bit, especially certainly on the aroma. And when I took my first sip, it like wasn't, it wasn't what I was expecting. There's a lot more structure in this cocktail than it, it smells like there will be. Um, and I, I'm guessing that that comes from some of that the, the modification and, and um, adaptation that you've done on the juice, like you said, I mean, it's, there's, there's a ton of lime aroma, but it's not super acidic. It's not sweet. It's, it's a, a dry cocktail. Um, you know, when you, you mentioned like a martini, like that's sort of like, it does, it, it feels, it, there's, there's weight to it, but not sweetness, which I think makes it a really enjoyable and probably a, a more repeatable experience. So Donnie and Chris, you guys are both from cities that are quite unique, Rochester and Cincinnati. Uh, both of these cities have foods that they're famous for that kind of integrate a lot of unique ingredients like the garbage plate and Skyline Chili, of course, come to mind. Um, is there an equivalent in cocktails where you kind of put everything into one drink and it ends up turning out better than you would have expected? What do you think, Donnie? Yeah, we have a punch a cure that is like that. It's kind of everything, um, but we build it the same way we build every other cocktail. And I think it's the same way the garbage plate is built, or whatever. The, what was this? Was it Cincinnati Hots or something like that? What did you say? The <laughs> famous Skyline Chili, which Chris will, will tell. Y'all have to tell us about that. Well, like any good food or drink, everything has. Uh, let's say it's it's a, like a, a aggression versus time, maybe. Uh, so we have like zero to ten, and then zero to ten seconds. So zero to ten on amplitude, zero to ten on seconds. Um, you have to have a beginning and the middle and an end. And ideally, it's like that. It's linear and straight. And there's a very slow roll off at the very end of it. And it shouldn't like, I don't know, come in and then go, well, there's a big flavor. And then oh, there's nothing here. And then it comes back again. You know, if it's a wild ride, it's not balanced. So we make the punch out of a bazillion ingredients. That are, it's unrepeatable. It's a different thing every time. And it's just kind of like whatever we have a lot of that no one seems to ask for that we really like and we want to find a way to use it. It's not like a garbage dump. It's, it's still stuff we went meant to buy. It's not like we uh, you know, bought 40 cases of discount wine that's due to and tried to dress it up. It's all good stuff, but there has to be alcohol and acid and sugar. Everything that is good is built to be predictable and linear and a pleasant experience rather than something that just juts out like a mountain range. 
All right. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, you know, predictable linear, um, Chris, can you, first of all, can you tell us about the, about Skyline Chili, the phenomena that is Skyline Chili and, uh, is there kind of a, an equivalent to the punch or the garbage play in, in the beer world? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Cincinnati Chili Skyline is the, the probably most famous brand. Um, mm -hmm. it's the, the, the history of it is Greek. Um, which is kind of the, I mean, it's, it's Greek immigrants to uh, Cincinnati, but it is, it is chili and uh, there's no beans. I, I think of it as I grew up with it. We would call it hot dog chili. Um, so there's meat and it's, it's chili, but there's no beans in there. Uh, but Cincinnati chili has like cinnamon and clove and all these sort of spices that aren't out of place in Greek and kind of Mediterranean food. But uh, it's odd perhaps in chili. And then the traditional way to serve it is it's called a three-way. So it's like spaghetti noodles with a whole bunch of that Cincinnati chili and then a giant handful of cheese. Um, yeah. You know, uh, processed <laughs> non-dairy American cheese food. You can add either onions or beans. That would make it a four-way. Wow. If you add onions and beans, that's a five-way. Um, you can also get it on a coney, which is just like a little, usually like a small hot dog with just, uh, it's wild. I actually really like it. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I should or do eat on a very regular basis, but it, it is definitely something that if you come to Cincinnati, I always encourage people to try it because it's really a very unique thing that, you know, it's, it's things that people are super familiar with pasta, chili, cheese. I don't yep. know. It's, it's really fun. Um, for beer, I think it's, I mean, I, I kind of what Donnie said, I think the, the challenge is to bring a lot of fun elements, but have them not be necessarily super, um, aggressive. Um, you know, I think we talk a lot, uh, in, in the, you know, professional brewing, when you talk to home brewers or, um, people that haven't brewed on a large scale, it's like, if you want to scale up a recipe, remove about five ingredients. Um, it's, it's going to be simpler and easier to manage, but it also, you don't need all that. Um, the beauty yep. of brewing at home is it doesn't matter. You just like, Oh, I'll throw in yep. one ounce of this. It, who cares? But when you're trying to do something at scale, it, it's a lot more complicated. You know, I think of like, you know, I'm sure Donnie thinks a lot about like a five ingredient cocktail takes a bartender X amount longer to make than a three ingredient cocktail. And that means they're making fewer cocktails or spending less time talking to the, to the guests. So, but I was thinking hops is probably the, the sort of exception to that. Um, I think blending bunch of different hop varieties can be a really cool way to find flavors that you don't get out of them individually. Totally. The synergistic effects. Um, all right. So I think you've probably had some time to think about what the, the cocktail is and you've kind of talked it out. Um, are you, are you feeling ready? Um, are you feeling like you're pretty confident, Chris? I, I feel moderately confident. <laughs> okay, uh, great. That's about all we can hope for. Yeah. All right. So go ahead and let us know what your guess is. And then Donnie is going to reveal it and tell us a little bit more about the cocktail. Yeah. So I, I, I was back and forth a little bit. Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going with number two. That's, uh, that's what I'm going with. Um, there's uh, awesome. that the, 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 um, the apple like cidery aroma is kind of what sold me on it. And then the, the lack of color uh, kind of eased me off of, of number three. Um, and I wouldn't describe this as um, hot. There's definitely some warmth to it, but it, it's um, pretty, pretty approachable still. So I'm going with number two. Great. Donnie, what is it? You did it. It's yeah. number two. That's exactly the, the right answer. It's a tequila spree well. And a spree well is a gimlet. It's a clarified gimlet. The point of this was to throw back the gimlet, whether gin, vodka, rum, tequila, anything that's a white spirit, because white spirits like lime and brown spirits like lemon typically. And we use a lime cordial, so, you know, mailing it in. The point was to make the gimlet of the 90s, that garbage gimlet that was like two ounces or five ounces of beef eater with some roses, sweet and lime juice in it. And I loved the texture of that drink. And I missed what it was when people used to come in and order gimlets in the early days of cocktail bars for me. I'd make them something I thought was better because I was like shaking real stuff into it. But they weren't looking for that. They were looking for a different texture and a different presentation altogether. So we just tried to do that. 
And that's the spree wheel. And the spree wheel is a joke about Latrell spree wheel, not because he choked his coach, the basketball player, but because he was falsely credited for inventing the, the spinning rims for cars that are spinning. It's a joke about a stirred drink. It's not shake. It's not shaking. It's spun. Yeah, whatever. It's not a funny joke, but that's why it's named that. And it is, you're dead on. And you said cider aromas. One of the main notes I got of this was like red apple, just eating a red apple with the skin on. Um, other than that, it is just cooked agave, which is that tequila smell you're talking about. I don't know if you've ever been around cooked agave, but I've taken a couple of tequila distillery tours. And one of them had raw, cooked through, and burnt agave as three of the you know items that you could pick up, eat, smell, take with you, whatever. And you can really get a hold on what tequila has been treated how, or which tequila has been treated how. If you very quickly flash cook something just to get it through and make tequila out of it, because you have to convert starch to sugar in order to begin fermentation and thus distillation. Um, if you just heat the heck out of it, you burn it. It smells like that. If you don't cook it enough, it smells raw. and almost like it has a salinity to it that's not even pleasant. It's just like a plant. And then right in the middle is that beautiful tequila aroma you're getting out of this that is like cooked agave. Uh, that was the point of this, and you nailed it, dude. You're dead on. Nailed it. <laughs> Nice work, Chris. Um, and Donnie, you were such a great guide through this whole process. We learned, I learned a lot about tequila. Um, I, you know, we got to play our game, had some laughs along the way, and it all culminated in Chris getting it correct. So congratulations to you. And um, thanks for being here. I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. Um, Chris, he's doing some cool stuff. Uh, he, you know, follow him on all of his all of his social channels. He, he's Shields E35. We'll put it up there. He also does beer talks um, live at 4 p.m. Eastern on most Thursdays, and they are a lot of fun. Uh, so join him for some of those. They also have a brand new Cincinnati uh, uh, tap room, and it is um, at the stadium or close to the stadium, a couple of blocks away. Um, so, you know, as you're watching baseball, go check them out. And Donnie, of course, always a great time to see you, uh, follow him on his social channels. He's Donnie Clutterbuck and, uh, he's, you know, a fun person to reach out to, to just like kind of talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, so he also has an app, um, in the app store. It's, it's free. It's called poor cost. It's a really cool pricing tool. You can get it on iPhone and Android. Um, and he's uh, just a, a fun guy to, to talk with as well as you, as you have all seen. Uh, audience, thank you guys for being here. It's always a good time to see you in the mystery sample challenge and for everybody at home watching to continue developing your palette and engaging with experts like these, uh, download the Sample Ox app in the App Store today. Uh, this summer, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of live, in-person, virtual events. So follow us on our social media channels to kind of be in the know. Uh, of course, make sure you subscribe to our channel for more of this content. Thanks again for being here, everyone, and happy tasting.